Today we're talking about the co-op games from 1990. But first, let's take a look at what else was happening in the world of video games. Super Mario World. Dr. Mario. F-Zero. Secret of Monkey Island. Wing Commander. Final Fantasy III. And we had a few home console releases. Super Famicom in Japan. Sega's Game Gear. And NEC's portable Turbo Graphics called the Turbo Express. Now let's get into the co-op games. Michael Jackson's Moonwalker is a surreal and eccentric arcade journey through the enigmatic mind of the pop legend, Michael Jackson. While it may not excel in technical gameplay, it more than compensates with its mind-boggling content. Playing as Michael himself, you wield a fantastical bluish-white light and showcase gravity-defying dance routines in a quest to rescue kidnapped children from the clutches of the nefarious Mr. Big. From battling pistol-wielding thugs to confronting towering robots with shockingly suggestive hydraulic battering rams, unleashing Michael's special attack turns the screen into a fiery dance number, leaving a trail of flamboyantly gyrating foes. Despite its average gameplay mechanics, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker offers an unforgettable and strangely charming experience that transcends its technical shortcomings, making it a game you'll remember long after the music fades. Two Crude Dudes, the often overlooked sequel to Bad Dudes, delivers a solid yet absurd post-apocalyptic romp. Set in a chaotic New York City in the year 2030, tasked with cleaning up the city from the clutches of the Big Valley Gang, your crude heroes embark on a comical and challenging journey. The game boasts significant graphical improvements over its predecessor, with vibrant sprites and expressive characters that inject personality into every brawl. Gameplay enhancements include a grab button for tossing objects and enemies, adding depth to the combat. Environments are littered with destructible objects and creative stages, including a nuclear winter setting and a tornado storm level that provides a visually dynamic backdrop. Two Crude Dudes revels in outrageous boss battles. While it retains some of the issues from Bad Dudes, such as occasional tedium and challenging bosses, Two Crude Dudes distinguishes itself with its over-the-top humor and action, making it a hidden gem in the beat-em-up genre. Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers on the NES is a refreshing departure from the often disappointing world of licensed video games. Developed by Capcom and featuring beloved Disney characters, the game delivers a charming and straightforward platforming experience. As Chip and Dale, players embark on a mission to rescue their friend Gadget from the villainous Fat Cat, battling familiar foes from the animated series. The gameplay revolves around hurling various objects at enemies, making it accessible for young gamers, but potentially lacking challenge for seasoned players. And of course you can play the whole game in two-player co-op. Graphically, the game impresses with colorful and easily recognizable characters, while the classic show's theme adds a nostalgic touch. While Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers may not offer extensive depth or difficulty, it remains an enjoyable and visually appealing NES title, perfect for a short and sweet gaming experience. Shadow of the Ninja, another 1990s NES classic, bears a striking resemblance to the iconic Ninja Gaiden series. Despite its lack of originality, manages to carve a niche of its own in the action gaming genre. While the game's two-player co-op mode attempts to differentiate it, it still finds itself in the shadow of Ninja Gaiden. Players embark on a challenging journey, armed with various weapons from grappling hooks to bombs, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. The game's pacing differs from typical action titles focusing on stronger, singular enemies rather than hordes of weaker foes. However, the hit detection and limited weapon choices can be frustrating, as short-range attacks leave you vulnerable to close-range enemies. Shadow of the Ninja's difficulty surpasses that of its inspiration, offering a single life and limited continues, making progress hard-fought. Nevertheless, it boasts excellent production values, with detailed graphics and engaging music. Despite its lack of originality, Shadow of the Ninja stands as a worthy addition to the NES action game library, offering a challenging and enjoyable experience. 
Snow Bros is a solid addition in the world of single screen platform games, akin to classics like Bubble Bobble. You step into the snow boots of Nick and Tom, two snowmen on a mission to rescue their kidnapped girlfriends from a Bowie-esque villain. The plot might not be a head turner, but the gameplay is a snowball throwing blast. Your goal is to swiftly eliminate all on-screen enemies by pelting them with colorful snow until they transform into giant snowballs that can be strategically kicked around to clear the stage. If you fail to dispatch foes quickly, an invincible pumpkin-headed menace chases you until the screen is cleared. Snow Bros introduces a variety of power-ups in the form of lanterns, enhancing speed, shot distance, size, and even granting temporary invincibility. The boss battles offer classic arcade fun, and the game's soundtrack adds to the overall enjoyment. Snow Bros is a fast-paced, replayable gem that deserves a playthrough, whether on the arcade original or an 8-bit console version. The Mini Run on the Sega Genesis is a game with a name that invokes intrigue, it takes players on a wild adventure with its protagonist, Kenji O'Hara, who is a Japanese, Irish, wealthy, self-made adventurer on a mission to rescue his sister from the clutches of the villainous Dr. Orca. The game starts with Kenji chasing down henchmen in a boat, offering a perspective reminiscent of classics like Space Harrier and Outrun. While the boat controls well and the initial impressions are promising, but Mini Run does end up being a bit repetitive. The game's levels reuse assets, and even a surreal encounter with a mermaid fails to inject much needed variety. But the game's strongest feature is the co-op gameplay, where one player controls the boat and the other controls the aiming and shooting. Despite some oddities such as the peculiar music reminiscent of Cheetah Man 2, but Mini Run still has some charm. And when it comes to the co-op gameplay, I think it's somewhat of a hidden gem, even though it might be forgettable. Blood Bros, the quasi-sequel to Cabal, takes players on an even more exhilarating ride, with its wild western theme and improved visuals. While the gameplay remains fundamentally similar to Cabal, the addition of a western setting adds vibrancy and variety to the levels, which include waterfalls, besieged towns, and mysterious caverns. The game's graphics are brighter and more enticing, showcasing the advancements in hardware. The enhanced sounds, particularly the catchy western-style music, adds to the overall experience. The gameplay mechanics remain largely unchanged, with dual heroes using guns and dynamite sticks to thwart their enemies. Blood Bros introduces comical elements like pigs as sources of ammunition and quirky targets. The enemies are more numerous and formidable, including bomb-heaving convicts, armed blimps, and gigantic birds that breathe fire. Boss battles are spicier and more challenging, making the action even more frantic. Blood Bros maintains the destructive spirit of its predecessor, while elevating the madness, resulting in an arcade classic that deserves recognition. Alien Storm, Sega's sci-fi take on the beat-em-up genre, is a spiritual successor to Golden Axe. Directed by Makoto Uchida, it swaps the fantasy setting for a futuristic world filled with aliens and laser guns, while retaining the core mechanics of its predecessor. Players can choose from three characters, each with their unique weapons and screen-clearing special attacks. The gameplay, while reminiscent of Golden Axe, introduces a roll maneuver, and players can switch between ranged and melee attacks. The game occasionally shifts into first-person shooting gallery segments and auto-scrolling running scenes, adding variety to the action. However, Alien Storm doesn't quite match the charm and atmosphere of Golden Axe. Despite this, it's still a solid beat-em-up, and if you haven't tried it, definitely give it a shot. Bad Company, a 1990 Amiga game, drew inspiration from the classic arcade game Space Harrier, but presented a grittier and more militaristic visual style. Released for the Amiga and the Atari ST platforms, the game garnered somewhat positive reviews from contemporary gaming magazines. Although it's often compared to a budget version of Space Harrier, the game is still praised for its solid graphics, and the game's atmosphere and sense of achievement in defeating tougher enemies is its strong suit, but it does lack content. That being said, it's still a reasonably entertaining game for a short amount of time. Chu Man Fu, a relatively lesser known game that came out on the TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine, is a standout title. In this puzzle game, you maneuver large colored balls across the screen, aiming to position them on matching squares of the same color. The added time limit adds a layer of pressure, 
and you'll encounter various obstacles along the way. What sets this game apart is the ability to both push and pull the balls, allowing for strategic retreats and surprise attacks on adversaries. The graphics are vibrant, colorful, and visually appealing, while the gameplay offers a smooth and progressively challenging experience. With a two-player mode, kickball mode, and a puzzle editor for crafting your challenges, Chu Man Fu stands as a prime example of top-down puzzler excellence. It may not suit everyone's taste, but for fans of action puzzle games, it's a solid and addictive choice that comes highly recommended. Cyberlip, a game from the Neo Geo era before the platform was predominantly associated with fighting games, pays homage to classic side-scrolling run-and-gun titles like Contra, and even foreshadows the iconic Metal Slug series. The storyline, borrowing elements from the Terminator, involves a malevolent supercomputer named Cyberlip wreaking havoc on a future Earth. As one of the commandos, Brook or Rock, your mission is to thwart the rogue computer and its arm of cyborgs. The gameplay remains familiar, with the twist of weapon stockpiling and switching, though limited ammo necessitates prudent resource management. While the voiceovers and boss encounters offer some excitement, the mediocre graphics and subpar music dampen the experience. Nevertheless, it's the game's unexpected narrative twist at the end that sets it apart, as your hero's unwitting role in a larger conspiracy leaves a thought-provoking impression. Cyberlip may not be the pinnacle of the genre, but it delivers a decent run-and-gun experience worth exploring. Double Dragon 3 marked a significant departure for the series, and not necessarily for the better. Developed by East Technology, it shifted away from the traditional in-house development of Technos and ventured into new territory with mixed results. The game's storyline introduces Mystic Stones, sending the Lee brothers on a globe-trotting adventure to recover them. While this allowed for creative backgrounds, it resulted in limited enemy variety unique to each stage. Gameplay-wise, the moveset took a turn closer to Renegade than previous previous Double Dragon titles, with different attacks and abilities. Notably, Double Dragon 3 introduced microtransactions in an arcade setting, allowing players to purchase extra characters, upgrades, and even weapons, a design choice that considerably impacted gameplay balance. The Japanese version offered substantial changes, addressing some of the issues but failing to salvage the core mechanic's shoddy implementation. Despite its departure from the series' roots and divisive gameplay choices, Double Dragon 3 remains a memorable, if flawed, and installment in the franchise, setting an unfortunate precedent for its licensing direction in the 90s. Double Dragon 2 for the Game Boy, despite its title, offers a somewhat unconventional take on the series. Originally a game for the Kunio Kun series, it underwent a gritty makeover to align with Double Dragon style. The transition worked surprisingly well, enhancing the character sprites and overall aesthetics. However, it retains a touch of Kunio Kun flair in its exaggerated moves and animations which may feel different to longtime Double Dragon fans. Notably, jumping is replaced with a crouch maneuver, altering the gameplay dynamic. The soundtrack leans towards a more upbeat and faster pace, reminiscent of Nintendo World Cup. If you have two Game Boys and a Link Cable, and of course two copies of Double Dragon 2, you can play this game in two-player co-op, which is definitely a novelty for its time. This is definitely a beat-em-up hidden gem that is exclusive to the handheld system. Double Hawk for the Sega Master System offers a unique shoot 'em up experience, and when played with the right setup, it truly shines. In this European exclusive title, although it's fully compatible with US Master Systems, players take on the roles of John and Jack, warriors selected by the United Nations to combat a global terrorist organization. The game unfolds through five missions, each consisting of scenes where you face off against terrorists and their war machines. The control is spot on, emphasizing a strategic balance of firing, moving, and using power ups to enhance your abilities. This is basically Sega's answer to Cabal, and it's one of the best co-op games on the Master System. Roland's Curse for the Game Boy, released in 1990 by Sammy, set out to challenge Nintendo's iconic The Legend of Zelda, and it manages to provide a solid gaming experience. The graphics are impressive for the platform, showcasing typical action RPG style visuals. While the character sprites and monsters may appear ordinary, they serve their purpose well. Sound-wise, the game offers decent effects and fitting music, enhancing the overall experience. The standout feature is the excellent controls, reminiscent of Zelda games, ensuring responsive and easy to learn gameplay. This is another Game Boy game that could be played in co-op if you have two copies of the game. And this might be the first example of a co-op Zelda-like game. 
Todd's Adventures in Slime World for the Atari Lynx offers a uniquely gross and entertaining gaming experience. Set on a slime-filled planet, you step into the shoes of Todd, armed with a trusty water pistol, to explore treacherous caverns, infested with alien creatures and brimming with valuable gems. Despite a limited number of levels, the game impresses with its vastness, offering a Metroid-like experience on the Lynx. Todd's versatile abilities, including jumping, climbing, and shooting, add depth to the gameplay, with power-ups enhancing your water pistol's effectiveness. But the game's biggest standout feature is that you can play this in 8-player co-op. Of course, this will require 8 Atari Lynx consoles and 8 copies of Slime World, as well as the Link Cable. I've never seen this done, but it is a lifetime goal of mine to be able to try this with 8 players. But I have been able to play it 2-player, and that's still a good time. A Nightmare on Elm Street for the NES is a commendable horror game that effectively captures the essence of Freddy Krueger's nightmarish world. Developed by Rare and published by LGN in October 1990, the game features a unique multiplayer option for up to four players using an NES 4 score or NES satellite, a rarity in the horror genre. As players venture through Elm Street, they must search for Freddy's scattered bones and then burn them in the high school's boiler room to stay alive. While the game's design is straightforward, finding hidden bones can be a bit tedious. The sleep meter mechanic adds an intriguing twist, forcing players to stay awake by consuming coffee or transforming into dream warriors with special abilities while asleep. The catchy music and diverse soundtrack enhance the gameplay experience, and the boss battles, though repetitive, offer some challenge. Overall, A Nightmare on Elm Street is a solid NES horror game that successfully channels the iconic Freddy Krueger for fans of both horror and side-scrolling games. Namco's Steel Gunner marks an impressive entry into the world of arcade light gun games. Released in the early 90s, it draws inspiration from classics like Operation Wolf, featuring 2D visuals that utilize multi-layered scrolling and scaled sprites to deliver a lightning-fast shooter experience. Set in the era when games were too advanced for 16-bit systems, but not quite on par with 32-bit systems, Steel Gunner never saw official ports becoming somewhat forgotten in Namco's catalog. In this thrilling game, players take on the role of elite cops in armored supersuits called gargoyles, tasked with stopping the terrorist army, Sturm, from unleashing a devastating superweapon. With dynamic scrolling, dynamic chases, interactive environments, and a range of enemies and projectiles, Steel Gunner offers an action-packed experience that keeps players on their toes. Although simple in mechanics, it immerses players in a world where everything can be blown up and every shot counts, making it a standout in Namco's arcade history. Scat, special cybernetic attack team, might not be as well known as some of the other NES titles, but it's a hidden gem that's worth unearthing. Developed by Natsume, known for Harvest Moon and Shadow of the Ninja, Scat offers a thrilling shoot 'em up experience, reminiscent of Capcom's Forgotten Worlds. Players control one of two warriors who soar through the air, accompanied by two turrets that add strategic depth to the gameplay. The game's short length with only five stages is its primary drawback, but its entertaining gameplay, catchy music, and simultaneous two-player mode make it a worthwhile NES classic. The action-packed gameplay and replayability, especially with a friend, make this game worth seeking out. Growl may not be a masterpiece, but it's undeniably a blast to play, especially with a friend by your side. This classic beat-em-up from Taito, originally released in arcades in 1990, doesn't take itself too seriously, and that's part of its charm. With a choice between characters that resemble Indiana Jones and Macho Man Randy Savage, you embark on a mission to stop wild animal poachers in Africa. The absurdities come fast and furious from wooden crates hiding rocket launchers to enemies spouting cheesy one-liners reminiscent of 80s Saturday morning cartoons. The gameplay may be straightforward, but the sheer number of enemies, comical special attacks, and unexpected boss battles keep the fun flowing. Despite its simplicity, Growl's co-op action make it an entertaining way to spend time with a friend, punctuated by moments of pure hilarity. So those are the co-op games from 1990. What games did we miss? And if you enjoyed this video, check out our video from last week where we talk about the co-op games from 1989. Thank you for watching.